example is it's actually quite a it's a misnomer how did you come or how did we come to Baba? Reason being is he made us come. He called us and he enabled us to come to him in his time. And the proof of course of that is how the, the Mandali greeted us. Wait until you see my children. I might cry. You've been with him for ages or you wouldn't be here now. So that's my preamble. Um, start at the very beginning birth. Uh, I was born with the umbilical cord around my neck. <laughs> um, luckily, uh, I was uh, in uh, my aunt's house, my mother's sister, and apparently I took several beatings before I, <gasps> I cry, cried. So, the <laughs> so uh, first memories. I didn't remember that. I just put, knew that it was uh, he. He wanted us to come. <laughs> oh, oh, there, there is something about that, though. My mother um, had had one one child that had died very early after birth, and a sister, uh, three and a half years older than me. And the doctor had told her you should not have another child. But she for whatever reason, whether it was something uh, deep inside her that said, but this is a must, I must have a baby Peter. I must have a Peter, a baby Peter. And of course I didn't know that at the time and it all came in, in latter years. So, um, my very first memories were in London in 1942 and it was the middle of the war. I was approximately two years old when the front of our home was blown out by a V2 rocket that landed two houses away. And you'd hear them come over, you know, you know, like a song. Everybody would go, where's it going to drop? Where's it going to drop? And as soon as that happened, I was pushed under a, a tin covering that the government had provided for people who were not able to get quickly to a shell bomb shelter. And the bomb went off, front of our house was blown in, there was a bay window. And my high chair was to the one side of the bay, bay window and I'm peering out under there and there was a river of glass flowing through my high chair. That, that was my very first memory. <laughs> My father was with the Africa Corps in North Africa, fighting Rommel, in the 8th Army. Not with the Africa Corps, fighting the Africa Corps uh, uh, with the 8th Army. Of course the Australians were there too. The Americans came much later and he fought up through Italy and he came back in 1945, I was three years old. Uh, he'd never seen me before. I remember my first question to him was, well, when, like, when he walked through the door, have you got your gun? My mother, it's my mother's story now. She loved me to pieces taught me etiquette, taught me manners, taught, taught me, I didn't know the words then, but the, as, as I grew up, I, I was a polite boy, 
and all of that. And it was all, all came from my mother. My father was working shifts. I'm telling tell, tell a, bit, a little bit more about my father. My father uh, was a doctor of music. Um, but when he came back from the, war, from the war, with two children now, he couldn't get a living in his old profession. There were no theatres, there was no... So anyway, he, he, he tried to get a living teaching piano and accompanying my uncle, who, was, who had been an opera singer, I'm just giving you this kind of detail to, to talk about music in our family. But there was no work, so he had to abandon that and get whatever work he could um, <laughs> as a security guard at Kodak. <laughs> Poor old man. And he was a shift worker. Like, so he, he didn't see, we never crossed paths hardly at all. He'd, he'd be asleep and I'd go to school or whatever, whatever. So mother was the, the lead, absolute lead in, in uh, my er very early years. Now I switched to about five years old and um, we would go to church and Sunday school. Um, the church in, in those days was, was packed, it used to be packed and it was an, it was an over afterflow from, from the war because during the war the church, everybody was going to churches, I imagine, you know, praying, please, Lord, stop this you know, nonsense, you know, let, where's, my, where's my husband, and, you know. And um, so Sunday school, I love Sunday school. It was fantastic. You could all, you know, all the Old Testament stories and Jesus and the New Testament and all of that. I loved it to pieces. And uh, out of that, um, I, for somehow or other, somebody spotted that I could sing a bit because we used to sing... So um, I was enrolled in the church choir. Uh, the reason I, I, I could sing a bit, because my mum used to sing all the time. Beautiful voice, beautiful voice. And uh, so somehow or other, I, I had that thing. And I, I, I joined the church choir. I went to school again, uh, somehow or other. Oh, well, there was a competition. There was a nativity play. And um, the, 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 the teacher uh, um, was uh, cre uh, getting the actors for the part. And so the, 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 there was Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and, uh, and the three wise men came in. But she wanted a, a, a singer to introduce them as the new people, as the new ones came on stage, you know, mother and child. And, so all the boys had a, a sing-off, if you like, and uh, this woman didn't like me. <laughs> I can't know why. And there was, there was myself uh, uh, um, and another boy who had a lovely voice. Um, but I was obviously the best. He had a good voice. And they, she kept going back to which one, you know, into the class. <laughs> anyway, I ended up doing it, and I was the Angel Gabriel, <laughs> introducing the, as they came on. From afar, from afar, they will follow the star. Church, yeah, um, I also, uh, I, I made my way through the ranks of uh, the church uh, choir. I became a cub, a cub and, a, and, a, and a scout all in those formative years. Still going to, well, Sunday school evolved into youth fellowship. As a choir boy, we had the name of the church was St. George's. Behind the altar, there was this huge um, stained glass window. And it was a St. George. And I used to look at it, the sun streaming through it. Where's Jesus? Where, where, where's Jesus? <laughs> now, I, when my voice broke, of course I left, I left uh, the choir, I was still going to youth fellowship. School days, um, I wasn't good academically, I, I didn't care. 
I was good at all the sport, uh, fastest runner in the school and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, I was a good fighter, you had to fight. Around about that time, say 15, after I left school, I, my mother, unbeknownst to me, had been attending a spiritualist church. It was that she had, had, was a good psychic and she um, went to a, a, a school in London, in um, Kensington. The person who was running this place it had, a, it had a, a name which I forgot, I forgot but it had, a, it had, a, it had a, a newsletter as well called Psychic News. The woman who was running this place um, said she was the, the Lord Maitreya. M my mother was going there and she was becoming de in demand at spiritualist churches because she was such a good psychic. You know, the usual stuff, they know, oh, you're, you know, but a good psychic. She was in much demand and she fell out with the Lord, the Maitreya. But in the period that she was with them, my mother would bring home books, um, in particular Rosicrucian, on Rosicrucianism. Um, uh, I remember Vivekananda. Now, two things I'd, I, I'd, I'd learned at, at this stage was that there were masters, spiritual beings, particularly in India. Rosicrucian says you must have a master to go any further than their uh, regime. I was also reading um, adventure stories. But anyway, in the, it's in my head now that there are masters alive and well and they're, Vivekananda and uh, Ramakrishna of course were Indians. And I read, a, I read a novel, I was a voracious reader even then, uh, about India, and I don't know the title of it today, but it, again, that there's this, this guru thing was going on. Everybody had a guru, everybody it seemed had a, every family had their own or the, a collectively one, or it was de rigueur, if you like, to, to have a guru. So it's all being implanted now in my head, this stuff, mother doing. She became a trance medium. In other words, not aware of what she was telling people now. Whenever we were alone, I should tell you about where we were living. We were, we were, it was a, a two-story house. We lived, we had three, three, three rooms. There was um, the room that had been blown up and repaired. That's my, it was my sister's bedroom. And then another bedroom, which was mother and father and me, uh, and a kitchen and a toilet, outside toilet. Upstairs was a, an, another couple. We were renting, obviously didn't own the house. It was a, an old couple that we had very little to do with. And it was some time before mother and, uh, mother and father decided to buy the house and they saved enough money to buy the house but much, many years later trance medium, kitchen, and uh, mother and I alone. Just uh, suddenly I had to, I turned to her and she called to me and she, her eyes were closed and she called to me and I went to her and she held her holds my face and said a lot of things. I'm a 15 year old kid, like I, I, I'm not to myself, but aware of a very powerful moment. Um, and that would happen from time to time. Uh, first of all, um, she said she was, no, she didn't know what she was doing. She did not, she would wake, she would wake up from the trance and and you know, you'd have to calm her. At one time, later on in the piece, she called me as you, you know, again, it was always by surprise. Or sometimes I'd try to will it her if I was feeling a bit 
It wouldn't, would or wouldn't happen. She called me this particular time and she said the same thing. God inspired. God inspired. Called and chosen. This is Barbara enabling us. But then I had another life. <laughs> A teenage boy running with the street gangs. You had to because there were no men. They'd died. Or, or the, all the boys, all the, all the youth were rudderless in a, in a way and they'd form themselves in clubs and gangs and fought one another such fun <laughs> and there was a criminal element to that as well uh, I was popular with the ladies um, I met uh, a woman I was I eventually married in those years, but I I, I had a rite of passage with my father, in which um, he couldn't um, bully me anymore. We had a garage. <laughs> I forgot about that room, and. Um, one third of it, they, they put a wall across and made me a, a tiny little bedroom in there. Um, and I had um, an electric fire, my bed, and a picture of Chuck Berry on Because <laughs> I was heavily into rock and roll, or, although at that time I was playing in a traditional jazz, singing in a traditional jazz band, we did gigs around the place and uh, ha had a skiffle group that went along with it. So we had a repertoire of eight or ten skiffle songs. At the, in, and I used to play three, three chords and sing away. I used to sing with the, uh, the, the trad band. We had gigs, but I was re really, I was really get, getting into the, to, to, the, to the rock and roll then. So around that time, I decided I was going to go to sea, become a merchant seaman. And I went and uh, go to the, had a 10 week or two month course, had to go away and live on the ship with the heaps of boys, young men, uh, about, around about the same age. Worked my way through the ranks, became a bosun's mate. Um, the big parade, uh, uh, in Albert Hall, every annually on Albert Hall, uh, in ev every year to, to honour the troops and every representative of the, every part of any army was represented. You had to march across it, the Albert Hall, if you've ever seen that big hall, that big hall. And uh, I was chosen to <laughs> carry the lad <laughs> for, for the merchant navy. <laughs> Glorious. Anyway, went to sea. Uh, whilst I was uh, uh, in, the, in the sea school, uh, the woman I was eventually married had uh, written a Dear John, <laughs> which you couldn't blame her, of course. I was a bit, bit, disappoint, bit disappointed, but ça la vie. Uh, and I had a year or so at sea, and when I came back, from the second voyage, I have found that all my old running mates, not all of them, five of them were in prison. So I was safe from that. A couple of months when I'm back, oh, I bumped into the old love. <laughs> and she um, um, persuaded me to, <laughs> to get back together. Uh, and I settled down a bit then. Uh, 
I was pretty good then. I I learned. Uh, I became. Uh, I learned to trade. I became a gas fitter, plumber. We got married in a Catholic church. Now I'm having not much to do with God now. Nothing at all. It's in there, but nothing to do. He's, I'm working my karma. So I, I, we got married. Uh, we were married, as I say, and it that lasted about eleven months, and we split. Far too young. No basis other than the sex. I want to bring in the gypsy heritage somewhere. First of all, both my grandparents, my grandmothers, both my grandmothers were first cousins. That's quite. That was quite common in many societies, but particularly in the in, in the gypsy in the Rom. They intermarry in the different gypsy tribes and often married cousins. That was quite normal in their society. They don't have a structural religion in the sense that uh, you know you're a Presbyterian or you're a United Church or whatever. They have their own way. But the music was huge in the society. Everybody played a fiddle, everybody played something and they sang. My father of course, I, I told you, was a pianist and uncles were singers and actors. But our particular branch of, or tribe of, of, of gypsies were, they played fiddles and harps and sang. And they were famous, they're really, their, their, their territory was Wales and they were, were known as uh, the Royal Welsh Harpists. And they, they played for royalty there's a book about them. The book, they're mentioned in a number of gypsy law books. So that's the heritage of the, of, the mu of, of the music. It came down to me, not in my sister. And incidentally, when I talked about the, the uh, trance mediumship, my sister never, ever knew, never knew about it. She, I, it's only like only 10 years ago that when I talked to her about it, what, she said? never knew. So it, she wasn't, my mum wasn't, obviously wasn't um, drawn to do that with her. Nice lady, there's a nice lady, my sister's a nice lady. But because of the age group, group difference, we never were close, never were close. Like she was three and a half years older than me. I was, and I was probably a pest. I know that uh, when she when, no, I won't say that. <laughs> I, 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 my mother said, you're spoiling your sister's chances. <laughs> if I was a bit rude to a, a prospective uh, beau. I got back into my old ways after the, after the um, breakup of the marriage in some way or other. Nothing petty, no street gangs. That was not on, that's all, that was teenage stuff. But certainly erring on the side of a side of not of criminality, but not active myself. My role was more of a protector of crims. I had a certain reputation that had followed me since the street gangs. I'd met Sonia then, by the way. I met Sonia shortly after the marriage broke up. So Sonia was my number one girl then for several years. And then I think well, the, next, the next catalyst was um, the summer of love. Started to awaken me again. Little bit of help from LSD. I went to Spain. Sonia came out afterwards. Oh no, Sonia went to America. Sonia went to America. I went to Spain uh, and did a season over there, um, working the nightclubs, again in the protector role, the bouncer, if you like. And we went again back and forth to Spain, up and down the coast for the next three years during that, you know, that whole 66 through you know, 69, 71, two, something like that. But I, we stopped going to Spain in 69. 69 was our last year in Spain. And then I came to 
together with an old friend who'd not been long out of um, a prison sentence. And we started importing cars from Frankfurt um, to, to England. American cars, mostly sports cars if we could get them. Because we, how that had been enabled was that another friend of ours had been was working for a, uh, for, a Chev for a Chevy Chevrolet franchise in Frankfurt. So the Jeep, well, you, don't, you don't understand, Frankfurt is, it was a huge, huge American base, still is, still is. Thousands of American troops there, big air base, big hospital, you may have Bagram, I think it's called there or something, the, the hospital. But it was a huge American air base and they would buy their cars and they would trade their cars uh, through, through this one of the dealerships there. But this, our friend was working for, for the Chevy franchise and he was getting, he would call and say, I've got a, I've got a Mustang here. Um, I would fly over and drive it back back and back and back and that's how we did it. We weren't supposed to do it more than once. You were allowed to get it through one car through the customs, but you weren't allowed to do another one. So you had to go to another port and go through there. So we were using different ports each time we took a car. So that gave us, gave, gave us enough money. Um, I said uh, time time to go to India. I've always wanted to go to India and like it's all well, that's in the, it's now it's in it's firmly in the DNA time to go to India. So that's what we did we uh, bought a from the same Chevrolet dealer we bought a VW camper van everybody was doing it this was 1971 now I'm 29 years old and um, went to Greece, you know, we drove all the way through Greece, through Turkey, through Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, huge adventure. Um, went, stopped last night in Pakistan in Lahore which was, in, 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 after you think about that, wow. Um, and entered India. We knew that there was a war, war was imminent. It was everywhere. There, there, and as we came through Pakistan, there would be crush India signs up and they had the bullet carts with, with, with which had field guns underneath them that were covered with straw. You know, they, and it was like, you're kidding, aren't you? Uh, and uh, we, we got through the border. Uh, the day before um, Pakistan attacked, um, we got arrested as p potentially as spies a day into into um, Indian territory. I mean, they were stopping everybody. You can't, you know. The, the military actually, we were parked on the side of the road looking for a hotel to, you know, a safe place to, you know, park. Military woke us up in the middle of the night escorted us to the police station who put us in in just left us in our vehicles there were two two vehicles by the way we teamed up with another group of travelers wait i forgot to tell you when we were in greece which is a very important step we were we were driving out of athens sonia's mother had come out and and just for a little farewell for you, you know, travel wealth story. And we'd send her off. And we're traveling through uh, Athens. Uh, we'd stayed in Athens. And outside the American Express built building that was there right in the center of Athens were, were um, travelers, uh, hippies, uh, with signs up, you know. And uh, Sonia said, oh, this boy looks nice. Maybe you can you know, give him a lift. So I pulled over and he, he, he wanted to go to India, so we're going to India, terrific, let's go, jump, we'll share, share the fuel and that. And we're going up and a conversation, where, where, where are you going? He said, 
we, he said, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to Pune. I said, what for? He said, it's for, it's for Maya Baba, first time I hear the name. Oh, yeah, I said, well, what, what, tell us, you know, <laughs> tell us, because I'm going to India to look for a guru, for a master. That's why I'm going. And he said, oh, he's just love, and I'm going to Pune to uh, American. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to I'm going to Pune to feel the vibes, man. You know, uh, and he could not tell us anything more other than he was going to Pune to a Maya Baba made a Maya Baba gathering, and he was going to feel the vibes. Now, and of course, that was he, it was a, it was an it was a, a, an Amatiti. He was thought he was going to be, didn't know where that was and didn't know, just that he knew he wanted to feel the vibes. Anyway, we took him a long way with us, on and off, across, couldn't tell us about Maya Baba. Anyway, we, I've got his name now, I've got his name. Uh, when we, were, we got through, we went to, we, we were, all the travellers then were corralled in, uh, in the centre of Delhi, you know, because uh, of, I suppose we were hostages in a sense that uh, Pakistan wouldn't bomb Delhi because of all these Westerners there and America was on the side of Pakistan and, you know, they would be, you know uh, uh, that would draw everybody else into the war. They'd start killing Westerners. After a while, we were allowed to travel and we went, we went to the Taj Mahal, you know, lovely, lovely. Um, on the way to Pune, we were going to Pune to find Maya Baba. <laughs> and, um, Okay, we get to Bombay, driving, driving through Bombay, and an army truck smashes into the back of our camper van. Nothing, nothing could be brought into Bombay because it's the war. And the only place that was, you could get stuff would be in Goa because it was a, of its connection to Portugal, right? It was a Portuguese, it was a Portuguese colony. So, this is all hindsight now. Why? But they said you can go to you, you can get your vehicle fixed, probably if you take it to Goa, and, and uh, of course shipping and air flights could go into Goa, fly into Goa because of because it was still uh, because it's been a, a Portuguese a Portuguese colony for all those years, and, and only like five years had it been you know given over to India then. It was untouchable. Again, it was the one of the uh, uproar. What are they doing attacking? You know, ta So we went down to Goa, and uh, yes, we got our vehicle fixed to the best of our ability. But that was because I, in hindsight, I had bought a lot of spare parts and uh, you know, other tyres and engine parts and things just in case. Um, I'd also bought a rifle, by the way, in, in Germany, but I did, and, and bullets so that I didn't need to use. <laughs> you, you can see what I'm like. Uh, and I'm going there, but is this, I, I'm taking this, this stuff with me, the, the build up. But, and yet he's still pulling me. Now in Goa, we, we're, we're, we're on the beach waiting for, for, for uh, our vehicle to be fixed in Panjim or in a, a repair shop in Panjim. And we you know the chat and uh, anyone know Maya Baba? No, they no, no, no. Uh, you, you should go there. You know, you should go here. You should go. To, you should go to Kashmir when this is over. It's something good up there. And, and we hear about uh, Sachi Sai Baba, and we hear about uh, Aurobindo. Uh, 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 there, we had that special garden thing going on down there at that time. Um, this one and that one. There was uh, a couple who wanted to go south, go, go south, go south with us, south, south, uh, east with us. Because they wanted to go to um, Bodh Gaya for a, a Buddhist course. Uh, apparently it was, it's, it's either a man or a system or both. It was called Gawenka. Jo, uh, Susie was, went there also. She went there and we, we glimpsed it. <laughs> and turned away. So going that, going down there, we went. We stopped off at Aurobindo's ashram. Of course, he was dead. I drove up to the gates there, and we were met by two, 
lovely young American ladies. And the mother will see you. But don't be quiet. We'll come back later. <laughs> that wasn't for us either. So we went and uh, spent the night in a, in a leper colony. <laughs> well, we thought we were looking for a beach. And that's it happened. There was a leper colony on the beach. We drove in in the middle of the night, woke up to these poor lepers appearing in through the windows. And they were, of course, speaking French, because that was Pondicherry, and uh, there was a French colony. Mm. And uh, they wanted to call their, you know, their looker after carer, I suppose, and, uh, and to say, you know, what we were, do what, what we were there. And we was trying to talk to him in my pigeon French, and he was trying to talk to us. <laughs> and it was hilarious. It was such a scene, and and they were so happy, these lepers. Sonia gave them a, woman, a, a woman's magazine and they went, ah, 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 you know, the dresses and the jewellery and all of that stuff. It was, it was hilarious. All right, so then we, uh, we, did, we, we, we said no to uh, Aurobindo. Um, we went to Bodhgaya with these people, those people who wanted to go to that Goenka course had left us and gone on. She wanted, they wanted to go quickly because this course was starting on a particular date, so we carried on. We went, we went to Budgaya. He had led us there because of the Bodhi tree. Well, you know the history of that. It's the, 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 the one that's there now is uh, its fifth generation, apparently, or maybe its sixth generation of the original. It, it went to Ceylon and it came back with cuttings and this, that. Nobody there, not a soul. They've got this temple. I, I, I think Susie was, may have told you about it too. She said there was, there was a lot of people there when she was there. Not a soul. Of course, what do you do with the Bodhi tree? You sit under the Bodhi tree. I had a, such a feeling of love, and gentle love, gentle, gentle love and peace. Powerful. Very, very powerful. So I've got a real taste of India. You know, I've got a, a real taste of a master in India. So we go on, on up to Kathmandu. And by the way, every time we met Westerners, anybody know about Mayababa? Because they say, have you seen the Maharishi? You know, you didn't go to, go to uh, Rishkesh, you know, and da da da. Yeah, all the way, all the while, at the, the point is we get to Kathmandu again, we're asking the questions, um, nobody can tell us. So we decide to go on a trek, uh, a trek, a trek on a trek, uh, to, to the base camp, Everest base camp. And we did, it took, we worked, walked for 13 days and slept on the site in different uh, Nepalese houses. And finally, we, we, Namche, Namche Bazaar is, is, you know, it's, it's the, was the, big, the, sort of the biggest town closest to access to um, the final couple of days walk to Everest base camp. Settled in there, then we decided, we started to go up, and we got up to Tengboche is the word I want. Tengboche is the, is the first, one you, first one you climb up onto the plateau, Tengboche. It's at about maybe 13,000 feet, maybe, might be slow. That's the place where Hillary saw the uh, Yeti. It was uh, then there was a there, there was a monastery, little monastery there, uh, some small dwellings, and um, this rock <laughs> guest house. <laughs> not, not a guest house, really. It was like that width. Anyway, when we arrived there, there was these two travellers sitting outside on the bench of this shelter and they've got a barber button on and I said who's that they said oh this is my barber 
I've been searching for this. Nobody's heard him. Tell us, tell us more. Well, no, we go, we're going down now. Uh, and, but we can meet you in Kathmandu when you come back down. We'll be in Kathmandu, we'll find, you, we'll find each other in Kathmandu. Uh, so that's what the arrangement was. So now we know we found someone who knows Maya Baba. Uh, they've just they've come up from that uh, Amatiti that the guy we were travelling with was going to go to that didn't because he fled once he, he got to Delhi. They, they he sold his um, his said his American Express uh, uh, travellers checks had been stolen off him, so he got and and he flew out uh, as soon as he could. Yeah. So we go, I get to base camp, Sonia stays a little lower. Um, they asked me to do a climb, there's a couple, there was an English, there was a small English team up there and they wanted me to do a, do a carry for them. And I said, no, thank you, I had tennis shoes on. <laughs> they said, uh, they asked me if I climbed, if I'd done any climbing. And I said, yeah, I've climbed uh, the pig track in, in Wales. He said, well, well, if you've done that, this is. <laughs> <laughs> they were a couple of characters. They were characters. They were very. They were world famous climbers. So I declined that. Thank you. And uh, we came down. We flew, flew out of Lukla. You've heard about the Lukla, Lukla flight, haven't you? <laughs> Off the edge. <laughs> Back to Kathmandu. Found them. Would you believe? This is Stuart and George Annal Erskine. We found them and. Uh, Ah, uh, can we get together now and you can tell us about Maya Baba? Well, we're going to go, we're going to Japan. <laughs> we're off to Japan. That had been part of our plan too, because that was the place to go. If you were getting short of money, you could go, go and work in Japan and earn good money. And then you can carry on with your travels. So we said, OK, we'll see you in Japan, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> Not, not a, a particular city or location, Japan. <laughs> so that's what happened. We went, we went to Japan at the appropriate time. We, oh, we sold, we'd sold our vehicle in Kathmandu. We sold it for a thousand dollars is what I'd paid for it in Germany. Because you couldn't get your vehicles out because of the, the borders were still closed and you were up for a, 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 a thousand percent import duty tax on it. They were, they were not letting you off for that. That was in India, not in Nepal. We sold it in Nepal. And um, I so, I, we sold our van to the Union of Burma Airways for first class tickets to Hong Kong via Burma, via Rangoon, and then Thailand, Hong Kong, plus a thousand dollars in Nepalese rupees, <laughs> which is not worth anything anywhere, <laughs> but it was a deal. So I went and bought diamond with it, the, the Nepalese rupees. Jumped on the plane, flew into Rangoon, went up to Mandalay, dropped off in, in Thailand, no, nothing spiritual is happening here, it's just we're passing through Hong Kong, nothing special happened there, on a Polish boat t into um, to Japan. To, and we ended up in, to in Tokyo, of course, and we went to the, the, you know what it was like on the road. You had new information, if you're in Tokyo, Tokyo, you go to this place and that cafe, you know, it's the same across, wherever you were, if you, you, you get that information and you give, you give your coming information to them as they were going that way. Nothing doing there. Sonia got work immediately as a hostess. And I knew that a couple that went to Goenka, that's where we got that Japanese information from originally, went, said, they, said you should go to Kobe. That's a good, there's a good place in Kobe where a lot of Westerners meet. So I went to Kobe. Sonia was working in, in Tokyo um, doing the hostessing thing for mainly for factory you know, the lower class, the lower tier the system there was every business had its own 
It was very feudal, you, it was in those days. Um, the, the, it's feudal and hierarchical, so you, you've got the boss and he, he, he goes to the top businessman's club, then the lower tier, the, the, the second tier management's got their own club, and then the working class have got their own club. But, and it's all paid for by the company and it's all tax free. So that's how that system worked. It's, whether it still works like that, I don't know. Probably in some form or another, because it's a hard thing to shake. So she got a work, she got a job in that lower lower tier thing, and I went to Kobe. Couldn't find. I found the place, the cafe, and there were Westerner or two there. It wasn't that thing, but um, I got advice about that club's that uh, hostess, uh, hostessing scene in Kobe. And I went to a couple of clubs and I said, I've got a beautiful gaijin girl, what are you prepared to pay her? And they, they paid the money. She, so Sonia came into Kobe, she was working that club there. What we also did was enrolled with a modeling agency. So it meant, again, that was a thing that if you've got a, if, Advertisers will often use a Western face in their, in their, in their advertising. So we had our photos taken and uh, joined this modeling agency just in case we could get a bit of work. That way, Sonia was working in this club in Kobe. We get a, a letter. Saw your name in the model agency. <laughs> We're in Kyoto. Stu and George Ann. And at that time, there was a bit of pressure from the police. They want, the police wanted Sonia to turn in uh, Korean girls because they, they weren't allowed to work. Neither were gaijins. We weren't supposed to work. Not the clubs. We weren't supposed to work the clubs. You could work the teaching because that was, you know, that was officially allowed. You were some special level, although we had no visa to do it. So we packed up, went straight to Kyoto and stayed in a youth hostel there where Stu and George Ann were. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful it was there. And I got work then in um, Osaka, you know, teaching um, through this teaching agency. Very good money. Sonia got a job in a, a, a very high class club in Kyoto. Stewie had all his barber books. He had discourses, this in humanity, this one, that one. And my journey between Kyoto and Osaka was just devouring the barber book, the discourses, and devouring. Wow, all these insights. What? Oh my God, you know, just. Blew my mind, what, you know, this guy knows it all. This is, this is the intellect saying, he's, this is something, this is the one. I've got to find out more about this. And they, they, Stu and George Andrew explained to them, you know, about Amatiti and how to get, you know, what, what to expect when you go and da da da. Um, so, anyway, we were there, we were there in Japan. In, in Kyoto, mainly, I was teaching, Sonia was doing that. But she was getting a huge money, $300 tip. I, can't, I was getting $10, 10 US an hour for my teaching. And that was huge money, huge money. And so we were making a lovely nest egg. And at that time, the Guru Maharajji was big news. Remember that one, the 15-year-old guru who was coming to Kyoto? He, and they had, it was a time where he, he'd, hired, he'd uh, chartered so many flights from different countries um, to a big uh, what a meeting in, uh, in Delhi. And uh, we went to see, we, we all four of us, Stewie, Stewie and I, uh, Stewie, you know, the two, us two, uh, us four went to, went to see him in Kyoto. It was quite pathetic really, but it's, you know, this little boy with a high pitched voice going, Check it out, you know, <laughs> not impressed. Oh, what was funny about it though, 
um, they had a big, uh, big banner behind him. He, he was with a, a, a looked like a mafia was w- w- surrounding him to, to put him on and introduced him on stage. And this big banner on the back and said, because the name of the name of the movement was called the Divine Light Mission. And this big banner behind it, that typical Japanese mistake, the Diving Light Mission. <laughs> <laughs> that brought some hilarity. Anyway, we had all yen, thousands, hundreds of thousands of yen, which we liked. Uh, we didn't know it, whether we could it, it would be accepted in India. Probably, but we were, if we could have got dollars, we'd. But that wasn't easy to get to just go and buy dollars. But uh, but Stu had a, a, a contact somehow through his parents. I don't know how it really worked. But we were allowed to cash in all our yen for dollars, which was fantastic. And we got uh, on one of the Guru Maharaj's charter planes. <laughs> <laughs> and they took us to Delhi. Oh. Uh, and it, it was funny, uh, we, we declared what we were, what we, that we were followers of Maya Baba. And they said, oh, Maya Baba, yeah, he was going to give he was going to give the word, but he didn't. But Maharajji does now. He gives you the word, and, and oh, they had t- they to bend their tongue back or something, or feel the nectar. That was their thing. Anyway, we got there, and uh, he got arrested for bringing, <laughs> trying to smuggle watches on in. Not you know, not arrested, but pulled up. And he was <laughs> watches. <laughs> We went to this meet, this 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 thing. Um, didn't want to go. There's another couple. We were staying at this Sunny View Hotel in Delhi. You can imagine. Um, we wanted to go <laughs> on the roof, and um, uh, this couple wanted to go and said, "All right, we'll take you." So we go there and we watch them. We were introduced to this was. Uh, um, Peter, when I, he was, gee, you know, they started introducing the people around him um, as uh, the disciples of Christ, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, after the thing finished, um, we are walking away, just Sonia and I now, walking away, and we come to this uh, cross, uh, about to cross a road, there's a, there's a main road, there's a road coming like this. And um, we had stopped on the paint for a car, and it was a a new a new I don't know what make it was, but a, a, a Japanese limousine. And in the in the in the uh, passenger seat was uh, Guru Maharajji. <laughs> <laughs> and Sonny goes. <laughs> And they drove off anyway. That was that was that. And now we're on a journey. So we we had to wait a couple of days to get a ticket to Bombay from Delhi, and we got those finally. Got the Rajthani Express. Yeah, it is the Rajthani Express from Delhi to Bombay. Down to Bombay. Stuart had given us all this. He'd written it out meticulously how to get to to uh, Naga. Um, terrific of them. Yeah, B- Bombay, and we got the train uh, from Bombay to Pune, and we knew the name of a hotel where we, we, we could stay, which was one of the hotels that you may have stayed in yourself when, in, you know, in, the, in 62, when it was at the East-West Gathering. One of those, I think the, the hotelier was Baba Love, and he was, and this is one of the, one of the hotels that they stayed in people stayed in. We walked through the entrance of the hotel and two or three young boys came running forward going, J Barber, J Barber, J Barber. And we go, wow, wow. And they took our bags and we walked towards the, the counter there and standing off in the corner, or Rustam and Sorab. 
we did not acknowledge, I didn't know who they were. They guessed what we were Bible lovers, no doubt, because of what the boys had done. And we didn't have to pay, didn't have to show a credit card or anything. They showed us to a room. Got in there, settled down, what's going on here? But we're very happy because we've got this great greeting from, you know, the, the bus boys. Knock on the door. Mayor Barber's brother is coming. We go, what? What? No. This is Mayor Barber's brother. He has to be at least on the fifth plane. I know all this because I've read it on the train between Osaka and there. Got to be on the fifth. He can read my mind. He knows all about me. <laughs> he knows all the terrible things I've been involved in all my life. <laughs> and the good. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, I mean, Sonia laughs because I, I showered twice. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what I was doing. Maya Brava's brother is coming, <laughs> and of course, knock on the door. Opens the door, and there's the little Jal in his boiler suit, and then. He's Jay Barber, Jay Barber, Jay Barber, and he goes straight over to our cases. And he whiskey and he <laughs> And it, that brought me right down, I was comfortable. And he was delight he was a delight. Tomorrow he's gonna he ordered he got the paper taxi, you know, the paper taxi story, you know that, yeah. He arranged all that for us. Jumped in the paper taxi. God it drove us through the guts. Uh, to Naga, I met Naga, and uh, to the bus station. That's where the paper taxi used to stop. And we got a <coughs> we got a horse tonga to Kings Road. Stopped outside there, walked to the door, walked through the gates, entrance gates. Standing on the porch were Mani and Erich. I didn't know who they were. They looked at us, didn't say anything. We walked to, up to the office. Artie K is there. He's taking all our descriptions. <laughs> oh dear. And then, he, then he, he suggested we go and stay at Dowlett Lodge. And we walked in there, and there's Stu and George Ann. Because <laughs> they'd come via. They come back by uh, Indonesia. They, they wanted to go up to, they wanted to go to the Jogjakarta and all that places because they hadn't seen that, and they were on the, They came back to India, so there was a a reunion there. Heather and Eric were there. Um, Jack and Becky were there. Jack Mormon and Becky, his first wife. Others were there, I can't remember. I think Kathy, Kathy Riley may have been there, but I'm not sure. She was there, but I don't, whether she was in Dowlett, I'm not sure. Ina Lemon was there in Dowlett, because I didn't know, I didn't know any of them except for Stuart and George Ann. And it, it was just, you know, it was just wonderful. Um, and um, we, uh, uh, Soros used to come on a Thursday, I think, Thursday night, Thursday evening. And uh, he got me to read his letters from Baba to him, to them, to the rest of the people. Nice, t nice, nice. Of course, the, it was Mira said, any time you wanted to go virtually. Mira bad, any time you wanted to go virtually. And we did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. For months, we were there for nearly six months. Then, just wonderful, just wonderful. The first time I went to Samadhi, the tomb, as we used to call it, then I'm still a head person now. It's all book knowledge, you know. Realize, you know, 
my mind has accepted that Maya Baba is something really, really special. Now I've met his Mandali, I know that these people are really, really special. So if these people who are really, really special are following this person who is really, really, really special, there's something going on here. So the first time I went to Salah, I, I, I bowed to no man. <laughs> Although, of course, in, in church I would have bowed uh, and I'd take communion. Yeah. But well, I don't know. I, I, I was a, Anyway, he just get down. And drag, he pushed me in. He pushed me in. <laughs> oh. So that's how I came to Baba by his grace. I didn't love him. I didn't love him. I was mentally convinced, mentally convinced that this is something special. I didn't love him. That takes, that's, that's by his grace. It's absolutely by his grace. You don't just love him. He has to give you permission, in my mind, to be able to love him. That was physical for me, loving him, the beginning of his grace of love for me. Well, it's simple. I'm in his, his room in Mirazat. And I'm, if you like, I'm not a meditator, but kind of meditating on him. And repeating his name as you do. I felt from the direction of his bed. I'm sitting inside the door in that left, that pink chair on the left. From his bed, an electric shock pierced me in the heart. Physical. That was his. That was his endowment of his grace. I'm convinced of that. Because I've tried to love him ever since. <laughs> Seriously tried to love him. You know, you try it. Uh, I'm going to step forward to now. <coughs> I love him. But there's no... John Grant, when he used to come here for Amatiti, which is really the only time he came, and he would be, he, he'd be alone here. He wouldn't encourage a society. The, the, he was here for Baba. He, he didn't encourage. You know, he was. He would respond to you, but you could tell that he wasn't keen. You know, a bit like Francis was in. You know, in the in the end, uh, I found him sit on the on the border of May Road and the and Abitaz Abode once, just sitting there under a tree, John. And the last thing, and the most poignant thing I heard him say was, just take his name. Just take his name. And like Merwin, just take his name. There's no technique. There's no technique. There's no, there's no striving, really. There's no striving to do his work or In the end, it's just take his name, because he is everything. He's the being of all beings, 
by the way, you know, it's the 31st anniversary. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob. There it is. 31st. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about my mother. Because I took her, not just her, I, I, I took her, my mother-in-law, <laughs> and because after that first visit, we didn't go back for six years. Didn't go back. I was a new chum or something like that in Australia. So I got to establish myself. I got a thousand dollars in my pocket. My mother and sister and, uh, uh, who had emigrated back in, you know, sort of six or seven years previously or longer than longer than that and they'd been imploring me to come because they they were sort of sort of teasing me saying your mother's going to die soon and she wants she misses you and yeah yeah and baby peter and blah 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 um so i went back sonia stayed at home looking after our, new, our baby yeah so khadija was three or something then and I took my mother, Sonia's mother, and two English friends who had been trying to dissuade me from, who knew my past, who was peripheral to my past, a London boy. I told him to come out here. I said, "What are you wasting your time over there? Like, England was dying. It was terrible." He, they'd come and and uh, uh, he, they'd come to Adelaide where we'd first settled, and before because we'd come up here, we come Adelaide, we come up here for anniversary one. Working down there is, anyway, I was working down there, I forget what I was doing, but I was working for a surveyor down in, in and I loved the job. We arrived here in 70, March 73, went, came up for first anniversary, June. Came back in uh, June 74 and bought the milk run, bought the milk run up here. Went back down there, packed up and came back, came to live permanently in Queensland in 74. Mother came to, mother, shortly, not shortly, some years after that, came to up to live with us whilst, well, we, we were staying in that house where the, uh, Tony and Tony lives now, and while we were building ours. Roy and Ros had stayed in that house while they built their house. That's how that all worked. And then <coughs> that, that, that house Tony, uh, and Maria live in now bought it was a sort of a halfway house before that people settled on this road like um, Patricia and Sam stayed there Lorraine Brown stayed there too to, um, Alice and Anthony stayed there Roy, Roy, Roy and Ros and us uh, Sonia Beda had stayed there well we built our house over here we took mum my mother and those to, to uh, to India. Now, I hadn't been there for six years. So, oh, we arrived and I settled them in to uh, Vilu Villa, <coughs> mother and the, and the friends, and I jumped in a rickshaw to go to the tomb of Samadhi and say, I'm here. <laughs> Silly boy. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going up the hill, palpitating, bah, 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 bah. and there's Nanaka. Welcome home. Thank you, Nanaka. Welcome home. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you. Welcome home. I <laughs> go, oh, yeah, please. Now get, get out of the way. <laughs> get out of the way. Go in there. Welcome home. <laughs> Finally, I get into Samadhi and I bow down. Nothing. Nothing. And I've gone. Oh my God. What's this? I'm totally bewildered. I expected a greeting like I would have had in gunning to his room here. <laughs> Nothing. Anyway, I go back to Vila Vila in my turmoil. 
And we go to Merazad the next day. Hey, so Erich had been at Mindra House looking after Merwan at that time, that year. He'd been away from Mer Merazad for six months apparently. He just arrived back, I think the day before we had gone to Merazad. So we've got off the bus, we've walked and there's money. And Erich is coming out of his cabin, walking towards us. Now, I, I gave Barbara money. She knows who I am because she's read who's coming. <coughs> I've introduced my mother. Money says, we've met before. At the same time, Erich is coming from his cabin, cabin. He looks at me and you see his eyes go click, click, and then he knows me. Like, he, he hasn't seen who's coming. And we come together and at that moment, see this tableau? My mother with money, I'm with Erich, walking out of Mundley Hall is Mira. And she's got gold, she's glowing with gold all around her. That's a tableau you don't forget. They, people have said Mera never came to Mandalay Hall. She came, she wasn't on her own. She was, uh, maybe Shelley or someone was with her, or Casey or somebody was with her, or even God, I don't know. I just saw this golden glow around her. She walked around and passed the blue pass and gone. Then, <laughs> for a bit of humour, my friend, Eric just left me. He's walked behind the chairs where my friend is and caresses him. <laughs> and he goes, Because ah! <laughs> he does not believe any of this stuff, you know. And he's tried to tell me how wrong I am, have been. I got it that she'd known her from, known that soul from before. That's what I thought. Yeah. It wasn't being, you know, I've seen you before, or I know you've written or whatever. No, no. It was, a, it was a, a yeah, that's what I took it for. I don't know how my mother took it, but. And when Ardy K died, dropped his body, and you know that, you know, that saga, I had, there he was in Andrew and to you know, the, we were, uh, I was staying at Lower, uh, at Mer Lower Meribad at that time. Funnily enough, in the old Mandalay Hall, the one that was, you know, irreparable, apparently irreparable work, uh, according to, uh, uh, to Padre. Um, and we heard the news and so we were waiting, there's Padre and, and myself, um, Heather and Eric and, and um, Bob Street sitting out on the balcony sort of waiting for the news and we get the news intermittently where they were, how the journey was going and um, then we went to bed and we were up next morning we were hearing the news again and, and um, Padre has, has set the um, has dug the grave, you know, he got that done, waiting, waiting. Big crowds were starting to arrive because they heard. Then I think their women, women had come and they were standing aside and the men had come and the, the curse, well the car comes and they bring it Adi K's body out on a stretcher 
and to take it to the Rahuri cabin. That's the one, isn't it? That, yeah. <coughs> I'm standing close by. Pendu comes forward and brushes people away. I want to see my brother. The other men are apparently indifferent. They're sitting off to, they're sitting off to one side, apparently indifferent to what's going on. The women have now taken over. I know this is tradition. I believe this is tradition how it works. The women always do this stuff. I told I'm told, I don't know if that's true. So they brought the casket out. It was on a stretch, it was in a casket, I think, at that time. I can't remember clearly now. I mean, when he first came. I mean, I could see his face. Pendu wanted to see his brother. Don't forget, they were there for Manzalimim days together. So they brought it out and they fixed the ropes and people are rushing forward to grab the ropes. And Gary Kleiner, you know what he was like, being taken in charge of them, they shouting and blah, blah, blah. Paul uh, calls me over to get hold of a rope because oh, there's it, 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 villagers want to take it. And, uh, so I've got the pleasure of lowering a <laughs> decay <laughs> to his last resting place, which is a very pleasant memory. But was, what impressed me was the in, apparent indifference of the men and Pendu wanting to see his brother. That was just... And the whole... And the other thing, of course, was Muhammad must. I can't remember when it was during the morning prior to or the next day. I can't remember now if it was foggy. <coughs> Muhammad suddenly starts singing. Biksha da da da. He has a beautiful voice. Have you ever heard him on record? Have they got him on record? Biksha da 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 da. Something like that. Much, much sweeter at that higher. He goes on like that, goes on like that. Then he stops and Eric says to him, No, what, why, why? He says, Look, the wedding of God. So, Muhammad seeing the union of Adi. <laughs> oh. I took my mother once more, too. She was 80. She got banned from the Samadhi. <laughs> she kept. In the evening, so she got banned from n n night arty. When I first saw her bow to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Baba, the reverence, the reverence she had. But she used, to, she used to become so overcome that she would faint. <laughs> and we had to carry her out. <laughs> and people thought she was dying. There was Jack Small saying, say Barbara's name, say Barbara's name. <laughs> Bless her. So I had the most wonderful mother. She was my first guru. She built the nice part of me. <laughs> and I worked out the nastiest. When father was away fighting in a war, here she is, like million, millions of other wives and mothers uh, who have uh, lost their men or their men are away. She says she was walking down a lane you know feeling 
oh God, you know, when is all this going to... Looks up into the sky and sees a pic huge picture of Jesus looking down at her with compassion. That's how she describes it. And when we were to keep getting photos from Pandi and Dad, I bought one specially for her and gave her a picture. She said, that was the picture I saw. That's the photo Mother had beside her bed for the rest of her life. That was the picture I saw of Jesus. I was working so hard up here. I'd, I, I bought this milk run, which paid nothing because it was very, very small. It was just three days a week across the range, Montville. And, I, and then I bought a mail run, or I bought three mail runs. So I'm doing mail runs in the morning and milk runs in the afternoon. So, and we'd come as, uh, here as often, uh, often, and it would probably be uh, weekends we'd come. And we'd come for Barber's room. We didn't come for Francis, particularly. There was, he was always kind of surrounded at weekends, not being negative on this, it was, you know, their, their way. And uh, they gleaned so much from Francis that I'm happy. But it wasn't my way to be, to, uh, I don't want to put Francis down, but Francis in, in comparison to the 40-year Mandalay, he, he was really second tier, in my opinion. Mandalay albeit, Mandalay albeit. But he said it himself, I was a, I was a pygmy amongst giants. I was a pygmy amongst giants. I, and he wasn't a pygmy. There were giants for sure, but he may have only been a, 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 a warrior. I think he, he was a bit, a bit confused about me. I, like I, I was slightly older than most people. Like I was five years, up to 10 years older than some, some, most of the people around here. I think he was a little confused because I didn't pester him or anything, never questioned him, and I even asked him questions about anything. I observed him, and I was almost appalled at some of the stuff that I'd hear from him when someone, somebody said, uh, Francis, I've got this idea, I want to do that, and da-da, and I think, well, you idiot. And Francis, yeah, go ahead, you know, full, fully well knowing that it was an idiot. <laughs> and he just, he, he didn't like it. If you're going to want to do it, then that's fine because you'll, you know, whatever it is, it's going to be worked out or not, and ta-da, it's gone tomorrow anyway. And, but I thought I was, I thought that was a bit naughty of Francis. He appreciated me singing some of his stuff. Definitely did that. Particularly that first one um, in that play we did. May hair, may hair, may hair. Your name is my whole song. That's part of a play that we did, and it was um, about the master singer. And what the, he had to sing, he, he was forced to sing the fire raga. It's a great story. It's a fantastic story. He has to sing it. The story is uh, 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 the Mughal emperor. It's probably uh, Shah Jahan. I can't remember which one the name is. Uh, who, who's a great encourager of the arts, and he gets all the artisans around, he gathers them around the palaces. And um, amongst them is singers and dancers and entertainers of all sorts. And the, his favorite singer was this fellow, whose name I can't remember. And of course, because he's a favorite, the other singers get jealous of him. And they whisper in the Shah Jahan, do you know he can sing the fire raga? Really, says Jahan, I'll get him to do that. It's, I'm ad-libbing this, it's not, it's not how it's written. And so under duress, he has to sing a fire raga. Now this raga is such, he loses him, the singer loses himself so powerfully that he could set the palace on fire from the power of his singing. But he's got to do it. 
and so he, he starts it's thinking, starts his singing, starts in the candles begin lighting, things begin to start smoking and then his daughter it's a beautiful story his daughter starts singing a water raga and so he's proved he could do it and, it, uh, and now Shah Jahan is so impressed. He says, where did you learn that? Or, or did you two learn that? And he said, well, I'm, I'm a, my master, uh, uh, you know, I have to take me to your master. <laughs> so he, he says, no, I can't. He, my, he's in seclusion. He doesn't see people, you know, he, he, take me to your master. He, like he's got no choice again. So this Mughal emperor goes to this Hindu master, which is a, the beautiful part of the story, and he finds the ma he finds the master singing, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Your name is my whole song. So that's the story. It's a lovely story. The, the Mughal and the the Hindu in that era. Now, uh, well, intermittently, of course, you know, uh, it's, look, <coughs> I've been, sometimes been called a prima donna, but you just heard that, that, what I've just sung, it's a prayer, it's not a pop song, and the clamour, will you sing this song? I had been, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd sung one, or, I only had two or three songs there anyway, for Samadhi, although Sonia and I had sung together once and Mera had been impressed. Uh, I've got a, just, R Rainey sent me a, a copy of a letter Mera had uh, written to her, uh, saying everything is fine. Uh, and Peter Davies sang and with much feeling. <laughs> That's a nice thing, <laughs> yeah. So back to where I was, was um, Jane Brown, yeah, the Jane Brown story. Yeah, so um, uh, um, up at Samadhi, and I don't think I sung that morning. And I was coming back down, but I had sung the night before or something, and the, some American woman had said, Peter, will you sing this song? And, and going, no, 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 oh, please go, please sing this song. And I'm going walking down, back down to the Pilgrim's Accommodation, down, down below, um, and Jane and another woman are walking behind me. Right? And I didn't know, and she didn't answer the question on the Zoom either, but I think she did know. Um, she spoke, she was talking to her friend and, and she was saying, I know it's like, I used to feel exactly the same. But then I realized how much joy I was giving people. And that struck me and that did change me a little about being precious about it. And I, 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 on that Zoom, uh, I was able to tell uh, Jane about that. And it was interesting because um, when I was singing prior to that talk, well, that, think that uh, acknowledgement of, J of Jane, she, I saw her there and she jumped up. When I started singing, I sang, beloved is all in all, you know, praise him, whatever you like to call it, on that Zoom, because uh, you're supposed to contribute something to Buffaloes. Jane jumped up and ran to get, ran to get her husband, so she, she may have known. And she actually, well, she, she corresponded to, with me later, after, after, only briefly. Thank you for, and um, you know, you know, Jay Barber, she's finished. But it was a catalyst. Um, so music, yeah, I mean, when I was supportive of Sam as much as I could be. And I, I, I sing to Barber every night <laughs> when I'm closing the gate. It's my communion with him every night. You might hear me sometimes if I get ebullient. Don't you? <laughs> yeah. No, I love to sing. I love to sing. 
Ah, all sorts of things. Um, all sorts. Of, I make things up, but I, you know, I rhyme them. You know, but stuff that we know. You know, um, beloved Mayhem, beloved Baba, you are Avatar, the divine beloved. That one we I will often sing to. And then what we were doing with Chris Hine, Mayher Baba, Mayher Baba, that I love you, Mayher. Thank you, Baba. And I always thank him. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your forgiveness. Baba, ba, John Grant. Baba, Baba, Baba. Baba, Baba, Baba. Mel and Jessel. Baba, Baba, Baba. No technique. He does respond when I sing to him. He does. I get a... I get a, a touch. <laughs> Not every time. <laughs> but then it's, you can't do that, can you? It's a technique. I oh, know, I'll go and sing to him and he'll give me a touch. I'll laugh. <laughs> No. <laughs> and sometimes the light goes on. When I'm, you know the light, the, the light that's supposed to shine the gate, <laughs> that shines on the gate so you guys can come out of it, see your way as you walk out, after you've done your walk. It's rarely on when I go out there to open the shop. Sometimes it suddenly springs to life. Oh, he's pleased. 